to thank God for the gift of life, Amen. the opportunity for us to be here. Other Christians have Christmas. The Adventist has come meeting. Amen. This for us is where we come to reflect on the goodness of God for the year that has passed. Thank you to the praise team for such a spirit-filled singing. Thank you. We are reading 2 Kings chapter 5.
I'm going to read it first. Uh, maybe let me give the elder first to read for me in Shona. Mazimambo, Echipiri, chapter 5, verse there 1. Zino namani mukuru we hondo zamambo we Syria. Waiva munu mukuru kuna tenzi wake. No munu waikuzwa. No kutu jova wakanga kundisa wa Syria na ye. Uye waiva munu we simba no umare. Asi wakanga anama perembuzi. Zino wa Syria wakanga wando rwa waka itama poka mapoka. Waka zoka no musikana muduku wa wakanga watapa panyika yava Israel. Iye wakanga achibatira mukazi wanamani. Akati kuna tenzi wake. Dai ishe wangu aiva kumuporofita uripa Samaria. Unga dai akaporesa maperembuzi ake. Zino mumwe akapinda. Akando uza ishe wake. Akati. Musika na wenyika yava isirairi. Wataura chokuti no chokuti. Mambo wesiri akati. Enda, ndinoda kutumanwa di kuna mambo wa Israel. Aka vaka enda na matarenda ane gumi esiriveri. Na mashekeri ane zuru zitana atu. Zemand, zendarama, nenguo zakanaka zine gumi. Aka enda nenuwa di kuna mambo wa Israel ya kanga ichiti. Zino kananwa di ichishika kwa muri. Muziwe kuti nda tumanama ni muranda wangu kwa muri. Kuti mumu porese mapere mbuzi ake. Zino mambo wa Israeli wakati achi, achirava nwa diyo. Aka varura anguo zake akati. Asi ndini mwari kani. Ndino ziva kuraya ane kuraramisa. Kani. Munu uyu za atuma shoko kwa ndiri. Kuti ndi porese munu wa mapere, ana mapere mbuzi ake. Asi fungai muone kuti. Uno chaka kuruwa neni. Zino eria, erisha munu wa mwari, wakati achinzi wakuti mambo wa Israel avaru zake, akatuma shoko kuna mambo wakati. Mavaru Mab, reiko nguo zenyu, nga uya hake zino kwa ndiri, aziwe kuti muporofita uripo pakati pa Israel. Na hizo zona mani akaenda na mabiza ake, nengoro zake, akandomira pamkoa we imba ya erisha. Erisha akatuma nume kwa ari akati. Enda undo shamba kanomwe mujorodani. Nyama yako izokere zwe kwa uri uwe wakanaka. Asinamani wakatsamwa akabwa akati. Tarira indangandi chiti zro kwazo. Uchabuda kwa ndiri akamira akadana stara jehova mwari wake. Nokupu, nokupuru zira po noru okoru wake. Agoperesa maperembuzi. Ko abana na fapari Izonzizi ze damasiko. Adzina kuna kakukunda mvura yose ilipakati pa isira ere. Andika shambi maziri ndika wawa kanaka ere. Ndizo zo akaenda akabwa ata mwakwazo. Zino waranda wake wakaskwedera wakataura na ewa kati. Nai baba wedu. Dai muporofita ata u... Dai muporofita akakura irai kuti chinu. Akakura irai chinu chikuru, amucha iziita ere. Ndoda za akati kwa muri shamba, uwe wakanaka. Ipapo akaburuka, akando nyura mjorodani kanomwe. Sezo akanga za taurwa no munu wa mwari. Nyama yake ikazoka, ikafanana ne nyama yomu anamuduku. Akava wakanaka. Zuno akazoka kumunu wa mwari. Iye neboka rakerose, akashika, akamira pamberi pake akati. Tarira zinonda ziva akuti hapana maripasi pose. Asi pakati pa isirairi. Na hizo zo zino gamuchira enyu chipo kumuranda wenyu. Asi akati na jehova mpenyu, iye wandimire pamberi pake. Andinga gamuchiri chipo, akamugombe zera kuti agamuchire asi wakaramba. Zino na mana akati. Kana musingadi enyu, muramda wenyu nga apiwe ake, mitoro yevu, inga, inga takurwa na maesera maviri, no kuti kufazino, muramda wenyu hanga bairi, wa mwe wa mwari chipiriso, chinopiswa, kana chimwe chibairo asi Jehova Oga. 
Asi Jehova anga kanga nwire ake muranda wake pachinu ichi. Kana tenzi wangu achipinda mumba marimoni kuzo, kuzona matapo. Aka senda mira parokoru. Aka senda mira parokoru wangu. Ini ndika fugama mumba marimoni. Kana ndika fugama mumba marimoni. Jehova anga kanga nwire muranda wake pachinu ichi. Akati kwa ari. Enda hako ono mufaro. Na hizo zo akavwa kwa, kwa ari. Achifamba chinambo chiduku. Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. Your word is inspired by your Holy Spirit. And without him, we are unable to understand and interpret it properly. So we ask at this moment, give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that now that we have read your word, what we will get out of it will not be the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. amen. I want to look at this story for the context of our theme, which it says we are chosen for mission. There are many things that one can say about this story, but from the beginning, I want to tell you that the message will, that I will deliver will focus on only two parts. The mission and those participating in the mission. From the many things you can say about this text, I will only limit myself to those two things. The mission and those participating in the mission. Firstly, if we read this story, there are two contradicting assumptions of the mission. Naaman is a very powerful man. Naaman is a gifted soldier. Naaman is a strong general. And the Bible says, God had given Naaman the ability not only to conquer other enemies, but including the Israelites. Are we together? The Bible is clear that even when Naaman was defeating the people of God, it was because God had blessed him. Because the Bible says, God had given him victory over all his enemies. Now the Bible says, this man called Naaman was then sick with leprosy. I will not explain much about leprosy, except one thing. For the people of Israel, leprosy was a disease. You got because you are a sinner. If you had leprosy, it was because God was punishing you. When Naaman was found to have leprosy, the people of Israel rejoiced because it was evidence that God was punishing the man who was killing them. Are we still together? When the news went out on ZBC, breaking news, General Naman is in hospital due to leprosy. All Israel shouted to God be the glory. The man who is punishing us, killing us, torturing us is now dying. So for the people of Israel, the mission of God was to kill Naaman. They understood the mission. God is in a journey to kill Naaman. But when you read the end, we discover the mission was to save Naaman. So when the story begins, God's mission is to kill him. 
When the story ends, God says, no, my mission is to save Naaman. Now we hear Naaman say, I am going to the end deliberately. Naaman says, I will no longer worship any other God except the God of Israel. The first thing I want to share with us, my brothers and sisters, the mission of God may not be going where you think. God may not be going where we think he is going. All Israel was clear. The leprosy is the mission of God to kill their enemy. Lo and behold, God had a different idea about dealing with the enemy. He thought, this man troubles my children. Let me make him one of my children. They thought, this man troubles us. He must die. God thought, you trouble my people. Let me make you one of my people. You see, my brothers and sisters, the church must be careful not to confuse its agenda with God's agenda. We must always study the scriptures lest we worship our ideas and confuse them for God's mission. The church can never be so arrogant as to think it is always right. We may be moving in a direction that God is not involved in. But from our perspective, we think we are with God. So the church must be humble at all times. Asking God through the study of his word, through prayer and dedication, constantly ask God, are we really going where you are sending us? Because your mission may be to kill Naaman when God is trying to save Naaman. Then you discover that you and God are not working for the common purpose. So, the first thing I want us to discuss is exactly that. The church must constantly ask, is this what you want us to do? Is this what you've called us for? You see, the church must be careful of sitting in meetings where we vote for ideas presented in big English, but no Holy Spirit. Where we are impressed by the intelligence of the presentation, but we have not stopped to ask, but is God taking us this way? You know, as a pastor, I have observed, and hear me very well, you know, sometimes I will be in a church just sitting at the back. Maybe there's a Sabbath school lesson. And I will notice maybe a poor man. You know, you can even see by his suit that ah, money has not yet come this way. And this poor man will stand up to make a contribution. And listening as a pastor and a theologian, I say, powerful. This man is right on the pulse of the text. The church will keep quiet. A rich man will stand up, make a comment that is not even in the neighborhood of Scripture. And everyone will say, Amen. And I think to myself, what are they amening here? 
Because we are not led by the Holy Spirit. We are led by the intelligence of man. Be very careful. You may think the mission is to kill Naman. When the mission is to save Naman. Now. Let us look at the people who are in the story. That is the second part of my message. The first, the man we are introduced to is Naaman. Listen very carefully. Naaman is not an Israelite. Naaman is not an Israelite. So what does that mean? It means Naaman does not dress like Israelites, does not eat like Israelites, does not pray like Israelites. Are you with me? But when he came to Israel, he came as Naaman. Are you with me? And the duty of God was to save Naaman. Now here is the problem. When it comes to Naaman, many of us cannot preach to Naaman because when we see Naaman, we want to see ourselves. Yet we forget Naaman is not an Adventist. You are. How can you expect Naaman to come to church dressed like you? You are the Adventist. They are Assyrian. They have to come like Assyrian. When Naaman comes through the doors of the church, wearing earrings and pants, the Israelites say, sorry, can't come into our church. We don't dress like this. What do you mean? How can you expect a Syrian to dress like you? How will they know how to dress if you don't let them come and learn? How can you expect a Syrian to behave like you when you've not given them a chance to live among you? Don't worry, that's why you're no longer saying amen. Because this one offends you. I get it. It doesn't make sense. No. She's a prostitute. She can't come here. Of course, that is what Syrians do. Where do you expect her to know better if you tell her not to come here? So, so you are expecting her to find Jesus in the street where she works. Because you are saying to her, sorry, girls who dress like you, don't come here. So then, how does Naaman become an Israelite if you don't let him into the borders of Israel? You see, many of us are not doing God's mission. We are simply looking for people to make an image of ourselves. What we are doing is self-praise. But it's called evangelism. Evangelism means meet the Syrian as a Syrian. Work with them as a Syrian. Until the day they learn to be like an Israelite. No, you can't come to this church. You smoke. I smoke. Yes. So I can't come to church. Yes. Where will I find the Jesus of the health message if not here? So you are now sending me out back to the world that taught me to smoke. But now you are expecting that world to teach me not to smoke. So Jesus found me there smoking, said to me, come here. I get here, you say, go back there until you stop smoking. When you stop, you can come. 
Are you sure you and Jesus have the same mission? Where do we expect people who are Syrians to become Israelites if we don't let them enter the borders? Naaman had to enter the border. When he came to the house of Elisha, Elisha did not say, tell him to go back. People like him, we don't save his here. Are you with me? When he came, Elisha knew that God's mission was to save him. So he had to be accepted as he is. So that the kingdom of God can do its work in his life. Secondly, how does he get to come? The Bible says he had attacked Israel, kidnapped a little girl, probably killed her parents. But when this girl was in Syria, she saw him diseased. The girl doesn't say to God be the glory he's dying. The girl says to his wife, if only your husband, my master Naman, would go to my country, the country he attacked, there there's a prophet who can heal him. Can I share something with you? Not all preachers are on the pulpit. Some will win people by showing compassion. Compassion and kindness can be a bigger sermon than a sermon preached on the pulpit. You see, this girl was no pastor. She was no deacon. There is no church board that voted for her evangelism strategy. There is no business meeting that gave her a letter recognizing her as a call porter. Are you with me? Where she was, she decided to convert her pain into kindness. My brothers and sisters, the mission does not belong to the Adventist church. It belongs to individuals in the Adventist church. Stop saying this church is not evangelizing. You are not evangelizing. When you say the church is not evangelizing, who are you pointing to? The building. Who is this you are accusing? Are you accusing the benches and the pulpit? Are you accusing the microphone? Who, when you say the church, because you are the church. You. And you don't have to be a pastor to preach, but you do have to be a child of God. Listen to me. There are people who will come to church, not because you quoted a verse, but because you became the kindest person at work. Are you with me? There are parents, your neighbors, who will say to you, can you take my children with you to your church? Why, neighbor? No, because when your children are here playing with my children, the level of respect. I think there is something your church is doing that I see in your kids. And I want my children to learn the same. My brothers and sisters, this girl did not need anyone in Israel to authorize her to preach. What she had was not a Bible. What she had was not a steps to Christ. All she had was her kind heart. Her kind heart was enough to send her master to Israel. The problem we have are Christians who quote scriptures but are evil in their hearts. Uh, are you with me? We meet people who are, at, who, when we are flying in aeroplanes or when we are preaching on social media, there are people who will send a message. Pastor, 
I am told you are Adventist. And I will say, yes, I am. I have received hundreds of messages with the same thing. Pastor, I would have never, ever thought you are an Adventist. Why? I have an aunt who's an Adventist, which I don't associate that church with people who are kind. They are judgmental. Your relatives, no one will hear the verses you quote when your heart is cooking trouble. Be the little girl. Stop. In fact, let me be clear. We in this church, we need to quote less and love more. The Adventist church has no problem with quotations. You know them, all of them. This is a church that has mastered quotations. The problem is to love one another and love the people around you. That's the problem. In our church, a pastor can preach and sleep with your wife. Huh? In our church, an elder can preach and sleep with your wife. Am I saying things that are not said in Zimbabwe? Tough luck. In South Africa, we say them. People who quote the scriptures while destroying your family. We need to create a church made now of love. The, the reading side, we have covered it. We've done well. Now we need to move to the love side. We are empty on the love side. Quotations, I give you 100%. When you guys quote Ellen White, you even do paragraph, line, full stop, comma, everything. Quotations are fine. And it's a good thing. Don't think I am, I am disrespecting it. It's very good to know your scriptures, to know your spirit of prophecy. Those are good things. But if love is not in us, we are not going to save anyone. Jesus had no problem with the ability of the Pharisees to quote. They knew their scriptures. Jesus would always complain about one thing. Ah, but you have no love. You have no love. The third character in this story. Two kings write to each other. Are we together? The Bible says the king of Syria wrote to the king of Israel and said, I am sending Naaman my servant for you to heal him. Now, that makes sense. The South African minister of defense cannot just travel to Zimbabwe. Are you with me? These are military leaders. Even if the South African Minister of Defense is coming to Vic Falls for holidays, it is the duty of President Ramaphosa to write to President Mnagagwa that should you see black vehicles with the blue lights coming from South Africa entering Zimbabwe, it's not an attack. It's a visiting minister. Now the Bible says, when the king of Israel read the letter, he cried. He said, oh, oh, this man is provoking me. This man is starting war with me. Am I God? Is that I should heal him? Then God goes to Elisha and says, quickly, go to the palace. Your king is panicking over a letter. The letter went to him, but the work is for you. Please listen to me very carefully. When the church is doing its mission, there are kings who must receive letters, but it does not mean it's their duty to heal. You are not hearing me. Let me bring it close. 
To be a good leader, you don't always have to think you are the one who must be in front. A good leader sometimes must authorize, but leave Elisha to do the work. Just because you are a pastor, it doesn't mean you are the one who must preach every Sabbath. It may be protocol for you to approve. Kings receive letters, but prophets do the healing. What am I saying to you? God's work is suffering because some of us have an ego. We want to do it. We want to write. We want to receive. We must be everything. We must be everything. You know when you're a good leader, my brother, even when things didn't go according to plan, when you can see God is at work, you can let it go. Uh, are you listening to me? Sometimes a church can plan a crusade, invite a speaker, and only to find they made a mistake, they didn't inform the conference properly. You know what the conference does in an ego? Stop everything. It's ego. Stop everything. Send this speaker away. It's ego. They are angry that you did something without their permission. No. Focus on God's work. Guys, next time you want to do this, do it this way. A, B, C. For now, the man is here. The tents have been paid. The, the food, the whatever, people have been invited. You've spent money on pre-campaigns. Continue. But in future, learn to do one, two, three. This church is wasting resources because men and women of ego are standing in front of God's work. How dare you do it without my permission? Good leadership focuses on God's mission. We can always repair an administrative error. But we may not find back a lost soul. We can always correct each other in meetings after. Hey guys, don't do this. Don't do that. But when God is ready to work, no ego must stand in his way. Let me sit down. Elisha comes and says to the king, send him to me. The king of Syria didn't make a mistake. It is respect to write to you. But he wasn't asking you to do the healing. Send him to me. But notice this. Elisha did not say, stupid king, I must replace you as a king. You're an idiot. As much as the king made a mistake, the prophet remained with respect for the king and did the work of a prophet. My brothers and sisters, the fact that your leaders make mistakes, it is not licensed to disrespect them. Are you with me? The king may panic and the prophet may have to, prof to correct the king, but that doesn't make the prophet a king. The prophet still remains a prophet. We may disagree on certain issues, but please be children of God. Never in your disagreement lose your Christianity. Respect should still govern God's church. Pastor, I don't agree with the decision you took. I think we could have done better here, here and there. Not you now going around saying, you see these stupid pastors. You see these stupid pastors. We are just being sent idiots from everywhere. Now, even your own salvation is at risk. 
Because though you may have been fighting for the right thing, you fought using the devil's tools. Christians must never borrow the tools of the devil. Even when we disagree, our tools must come from Jesus. Even when we disagree, our weapons must be borrowed from the Holy Spirit. We never borrow demonic power to do godly work. Are you with me? Disagree, that's fine. We go to a session. We disagree with what the conference did or what the union did. That's okay. But don't get on the session floor carrying the weapons of a demon to do God's work. Get there, carry the weapons of the spirit. Get there wearing the armor of Christ. You are here to fight, but you will fight like a saved child of God. As much as the king made a mistake, the prophet never disrespected him, never humiliated him. He still respected him as a king, corrected him as a king, and did not diminish him. Oh, brothers and sisters, please. There is too much disrespect in our churches. There is too much looking down on people. It is ungodly. It is unrighteous. In fact, let me tell you something worse. Rather lose like a Christian than win like a pagan. If you have tried the godly way and there is no response, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, take your losses, but walk away still in the power of the Holy Spirit. Than to say you won, but your victory required the Holy Spirit to leave the building. So, Naaman comes to Elisha. Elisha doesn't even meet him. Elisha says, Gehaz, go tell him. Tell him to go and dip himself seven times. General Naaman is a minister of defense. When he gets there, he says it. I expected better treatment. A red carpet, you know, a silver spade, a plant here. We are first going to do some photo shoot. Plant a tree in memory of my visit. You know, we will cut a red ribbon. Then from there, he will wave his hands, shout, and I will be healed. What is God teaching us through Elisha? When doing God's mission, you may end up evangelizing rich and powerful people. Never, ever make them think they are more valuable than a poor soul. Don't do that. You know, my practice, even now I do it. When I come to where the, we are eating, they'll always say, pastors, please come up front. And I always say to people, but hunger doesn't ask what you're calling. When I get there and there are people queuing, we are all hungry. No one becomes less hungry because they are ordinary and the pastor is hungry bigger. Let the people dish. I will also get there. I don't do it because I don't acknowledge that the church is trying to respect me. But I am doing it because I was born in a very poor family. I grew up with no one knowing my name. People who saw me almost every Sabbath kept asking me, what's your name? But when I became a pastor, they would say, this is our son. We raised him. Hypocrites. So I knew, I knew 
never ever to treat others as I was treated. When I see someone queuing and I'm told to go ahead, I see me as a child. I see myself in them and I say, I remember this. To be treated like I'm nothing because my family is poor. Don't do it. Don't do it. When you go out for God's mission, when you invite people to come to your church, don't make the rich and the powerful feel more important and the poor just disappear. Elisha says, Gehazi, go tell him to go deep there. He's not the only one who's come here with leprosy. Others have come also, they went and dipped. Tell him, go deep. General or no general, same river, same water. Go deep. Can't say, yeah, the president of Zimbabwe is giving his life to the Adventist church. We need to baptize him. Then suddenly, we need to look for a golden pool because the president is converting. Huh? Now we must buy 100% natural water and pour it in there because we are baptizing the president. But when it's the rest of us, even a river with co crocodiles is fine. Just put them in there, take them out. What are you saying to a poor person? Are you telling them the kingdom of God is about class? Elisha says, Gehazi, go tell him to dip himself. After protesting, he went because his servants said, hey, look, we have traveled a very long distance, number one. This is an international trip. We moved from Syria. We got to the border. We produced passports. They were stamped. We came here. You were expecting him to do big things, but he's asking you to do something small. You, re you refuse. Let's go deep. Might as well go. If it doesn't work, at least we had a swim. But let's go. So they all go there. He dips. I won't focus on that part because as I said, I'm focusing on mission and the participants. He comes out, he's healed. But he wasn't just healed, he was born again. That is what we don't understand. The Bible says when he came out, he had the skin of a child. That is why. He now goes back to Elisha. Listen to the words. He no longer speaks like a Syrian. He speaks like an Israelite. He says, he says, I, I will no longer worship any other God but the God of Israel. Why? Because it was inside the borders that he was born again. He has new citizenship. His citizenship is of the kingdom of God but he still works in a foreign land. You see it has changed? Now he is employed in a foreign land, but his citizenship is in Israel. And he goes to Elisha, he says, my Lord, please give me some soil, anything, because I am no longer. Now you understand why he didn't ask for water. Think about it. He was healed by water, but he asks for soil. Because soil is about identity. You hear him. He says, I will no longer bow to the altars of other gods. Why? Because when he gets home, he will destroy the altar of Ramon, the god of the Syrians. He will dig out the soil of Syria. Throw it away. He will pour soil from Israel. Build an altar to God. And in the morning... He will wake up, stand on that soil, and when he prays, he will say, God of my nation, here I am in a foreign land, but I stand on your holy ground. Be with me while I worship you in this foreign land. Identity had changed. But follow very carefully. Then he says one more thing to Elisha. He says, but now, listen, I am still a general for king of Syria. And the king of Syria worships Ramon, not me. I no longer worship Ramon. 
So he says, when the king goes into the temple to worship, as his general, I must be by his side. I love Naman, skilled speaker. He says, because the king is old, when he goes down to bow, he will hold on me. And I will have to go down with him. May God forgive me for bowing in front of foreign gods. What is he saying? He is saying, though now I know who God is, to make changes in my life will take time. I won't be able to change everything over one night. May God be patient with me. Elisha didn't listen to Elisha. Elisha doesn't say, you hypocrite. After what God has done for you, how could you say that? God will curse you. Elisha says, go in peace. In other words, your transformation is now in the hands of the spirit. It is him who will guide you till you come right. Beloved, you can't decide for people when they should have converted by what time. Your duty is to preach, not to set the timetable. The timetable of transformation is between the Holy Spirit and the converting person. Go in peace. God will be with you. You will come here every Sabbath. You will learn with every day, every year. You will get better and better. Some things you will struggle with for some years. Some you will overcome over an hour. All of it depends on the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Never put your position, yourself in the position of the Spirit. Can't tell people, how? You've been uh, baptized for 10 years. You are still doing this. Where's your timetable for the things you are still doing? Where is the calendar for the things you are still struggling with? Are you with me, church? Elisha trusted that the Holy Spirit would take care of Naaman until Naaman can stand up for his faith. Until that day, the Spirit would work on him. Now, brothers and sisters, go in peace. Whatever you are struggling with, keep praying for it. Keep studying God's word. Keep trying to do the right thing. When the time is right, the work of the Spirit will be fulfilled in us. Be patient with others as God has been patient with you. God bless you. Kuneko penya mo gomone kupenya mo nyanza ne malanje anoka ramonje bo zakanaka amoka te ti me moyo wa wango ma.
Tasenye kote iwawe neni to zopone swa kune mazamara indaramano so shate na pina kana tapo neswa Jesu diemwenge we oyomoso. Sing a cheer, Mary.